Marine Testinar from Combibis. My name is Sylvia Schreiber. I'm working with Combibis and I will be the moderator of this session, of this Marine Testinar ses session. session uh, the testinar is a fusion word uh, out of testing and webinar. In fact, it's an electronic pitching event, so we have projects who present and pitch and we have an evaluator who gives feedback and comment. Our evaluator is Horde Christensen from Iceland. So we will have three projects this morning. It is first then the Araina project which deals with aquaculture and fishery nutrition. Then we will hear from a startup from Ekaduna how it works to produce micro uh, algae biomass on a bioreactor, Ecoduna is the name of the startup, and the third project is Primefish, which is dealing with seafood markets on a local but also on a global scale. Our evaluator, I welcome very much and thank for the participation, is Dr. Horde G. Christensen. He is Chief Science and Innovation Officer from Matis in Iceland. Matis is a government-funded R&D agency in the bioeconomy dealing with the, uh, the bridging between academia and industry in the bioeconomy field, mainly in fisheries. And that's also a special a speciality from Horde. Horde is a, a food chemist, a food biochemist by training, and he holds a professorship uh, in Florida, but also the chief science uh, scientist position at Martes, and he will give us his keynote on where is the blue bioeconomy heading to. Horda, over to you, please. Many thanks, Sylvia, um, for this introduction. Um, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, webinar about unlocking the great potential that we have in what, what I call the blue bioeconomy. So uh, what do I mean by the term bioeconomy, uh, which is the next slide? Uh, the bioeconomy comprises those parts of the economy that use renewable biological resources from both land and sea in a responsible way, but with the aim at resulting in a profit for both businesses, society, and also nature. And the blue bioeconomy deals with, with, with the oceans and the freshwater, and it's unfortunately often uh, overlooked, but it represents uh, some major economic activities and also some excellent future potential. Uh, in the bioeconomy, including the blue bioeconomy, we're faced with some major challenges that we need to solve. And this includes having enough nutritious and safe food for our growing population, finding new and more environmentally friendly energy sources. Uh, we're also tackling global warming, which can have a major disruptive effect on both land, water, and oceans. And finally, we're dealing with some major changes in our demographics, which all call for new solutions to meet the needs of the changing and growing, uh, growing population. Now, before we talk about the opportunities and trends, <clears throat> Uh, so next slide. It's important to look at the facts when it comes to the uh, uh, ocean and freshwater. And this particular example shows how fish and fishery pr production compares to the total food production uh, in the world. And this does not include algae, by the way. So this is fish and fishery production. So while 71% of the Earth's surface is covered by water, we only get about 3.5% of our food from uh, fish and fishery products. Uh, however, Fish and fishery products are a very important protein source, and they actually account for about 10% of the human protein intake on a global scale. And the situation now is that almost half of our fish and fishery products come from aquaculture. And in the future, we expect aquaculture production to surpass traditional fisheries when it comes to how we get our, uh, get our seafood. And while this picture uh, picture shows that 88% of fishery products goes to human consumption, it doesn't mean that all of the 147 million tons end up on our plate, uh, actually far from it, uh, because we have very poor utilization and we have a lot of waste in the supply chain, so the consumption is actually much, much uh, lower. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the value chain, like I said, is unfortunately 
still very inefficient and we are wasting biomass in pretty much all links of the value chain and, and this cannot continue if we're going to move towards the uh, a sustainable future when it comes to the, the, the oceans. So biomass lost at sea, for example, is an average uh, 8% and in the EU uh, it's from 20% to a whopping uh, 60% actually in some cases. And utilization in uh, finfish processing is also highly variable and it's common to have around 40% utilization. And uh, uh, need the next click, please, so we can move through the slide. Uh, and then there are some significant post-process losses, especially at the consumer level. So the fact that only small part of what's caught um, ends up, uh, a very small part of what's caught actually ends up being consumed uh, by humans. So if you continue clicking in this example, you can see that only around 21% in this example actually ends up on our plate. And uh, there are thankfully potential areas where we can significantly improve utilization. And this is, for example, uh, including uh, uh, discard bands, which we have in, in Europe now. Uh, improved fishing gear and strategies can also contribute to or, or reduce or even eliminate discards. And then investing in better technology and processes, as well as product development, can substantially improve utilization and processing. And then, of course, we have improved packaging, traceability, and log logistics, along with better consumers. Uh, and all of these can also contribute to improvement. So we can incrementally improve our utilization throughout the whole value chain, and it's very important we do so. Every percent in each link of the value chain can have a significant uh, economical and environmental impact. Next slide, please. So there are, in addition to the traditional products uh, we get from marine and freshwater species, there are, uh, there are literally endless opportunities with the so-called byproducts that we have to, to work with. And there are significant byproducts in the industry. And work over the last few decades has demonstrated that some of these byproducts that contain far more valuable ingredient than the actual, actually the traditional raw materials. And some might even go so far to say that the byproducts might become the more valuable products in the future than the traditional products. Uh, we're seeing companies uh, developing even medical and cosmetic products from, for example, fish skin, uh, uh, and also they're, they're, they're uh, getting fish enzymes from fish, fish guts. They're creating supplements from uh, fish trimmings and fish skin. They're even creating uh, or, or producing leather from fish skin, just to name, uh, name a few examples. So there are, there are endless opportunities with, with the byproducts and really creating high value uh, uh, marketable products that consumers are, are, are uh, seeking. So last but not least, the next slide. Uh, what are the hottest trends when it comes to the blue bioeconomy and its products? And there are really no single trend or even a handful of trends. There are actually a lots of trends that are moving the industry in the right direction. And the trends are really meeting the grand challenges I spoke of before. And the seafood industry, as we know, has been pretty traditional in the past, but this is changing now. And there's a lot of momentum in the industry to adapt to the ever-changing times and meet the needs of, of the future customers and society. And these are some of the top trends I listed, and I actually consulted with quite a few experts on the top trends in the, in the industry, and this is what we, what we came up with. And I'm not going to go through each and every one of them, but obviously sustainability is huge, full utilization is, is, is really big, also the environmental impact of the industry is big, and then we have all these new industries, uh, the marine biotechnology industry, uh, that's creating interesting bioactive products. And, and we also want to market marine foods as the next superfood. And then the question is, do we go for wild fish or do we go for cultured fish and what's, what's the ba balance? And how do we develop, for example, the aquaculture industry and how do we develop the, uh, uh, the, the, the wild harvest industry? And then these days it's ever more important now to, uh, to have information, uh, not just for the industry but also for the consumers because the consumers want to be engaged in their products and they really they, 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 they want transparency when it comes to uh, the value chain, the product value chain. So it's important to involve the consumer in every, every part of the chain and get them involved in, in product uh, development, just to give, uh, give a few examples. So that's a brief introduction from me, and uh, I will now uh, leave it to Sylvia. Thank you. Yes.
Thank you very much, Horda, for this very, very interesting introduction in the blue world, <laughs> in the blue potential, which we got or you as specialists to unlock. And you touched a lot of topics we will tackle now. We will have our first project. It's Arena. Arena is a um, FP7 project dealing with fish nutrition in aquaculture. So it stands for Advanced Research Initiatives for Nutrition and Aquaculture. Um, our presenter is Sadavisam uh, Kaushik Sachi. Everybody tell, uh, tells Sachi. And Sachi is professor, a specialist in fish nutrition. He was long years director of research in INRA. It's the National Institute of Agronomic uh, Research of France. And he was very involved in many, many projects of the aquaculture industry. And uh, he, his role in these projects where how can we ensure nutritional quality and food safety of farmed seafood? And I have a specific question to Sachi is, how can you influence the taste of farmed fish with the fish nutrition? Please, over to you. Thank you. Do you hear, all of you, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. If there are some questions, please do this for the audience in written procedure and listen to Sachi's presentation now. Thank you. Okay, so we had a very good introduction just now. Uh, aquaculture supplies nearly 50% of seafood today. And uh, at the EU level, it's about 25%. But when we are thinking of growing fish, all of our fish in Europe are grown with feeds, which is not necessarily the case in Asia where the aquaculture development is happening with the crops in China and India. So formulated aqua feeds is common in Europe, which is not yet common in Asia. About four million tons of feeds are made, but these feeds are totally different from terrestrial animal feeds. Fish feeds are nutrient dense, rich in protein, high fat, high energy, and which requires about 2 million tons of proteins and 0.5 to 0.6 million tons of fats. And majority of this used to be coming from fish meal and fish oil, which was mentioned about a good portion, about 17 to 20 million tons of capture fisheries is converted into fish meal and fish oil. But with the development of aquaculture, this cannot be considered as sustainable. So we've been working as scientists from different parts of Europe, trying to replace what our full amount of fish meal and fish oil in the feeds for fish. In this Arena project, is a uh, summary, uh, takes benefit of all that has been done in the pre previous years through different other projects like PEPFA, RAFWA, which were dealing individually with fish meal and fish oil separately. And we had a recent one which is called Aquamax. And this particular project, next slide please, to work on five species of fish of European interest, Atlantic salmon, rainbow trout, European sea bass, gilted sea bream, and common carp and to grow them from larvae to brood stock size with low levels of fish meal and fish oil in the feeds. All the studies were done in close link with the industry as well as uh, fish farming industry as well as feed industry. And we have come across a number of issues. As scientists, we look at all possible consequences, what could be the effects in terms of quality, in terms of, I'll come back to your question, in terms of environmental impacts, in terms of sustainability. And also we have developed three technical booklets which can be of use for anyone in common. So it's a feed ingredients for use in aquaculture, improved knowledge on nutrient requirements of fish, and, and very recently, we've got the book on biomarkers of fish performance, trying to see what are the possible biomarkers which can be used by the industry as well as scientists 
uh, to evaluate the effects of dietary factors. In terms of practical information, the studies have led to the flexibility in the choice of feed strips, develop specific nutrient mixes, feeds with improved availability, and having done all this, we are also running right now, it's almost finishing, a proof of concept challenge. Whatever has been achieved in terms of science or is being tested at a large scale in Norway with the salmon uh, producer company. Next slide, please. All this was accomplished with uh, practically 50% of science and 50% of industry, SMEs involved, feed companies, farmers, stakeholder advisory board. We had FEFAC, FEAP, European Aquaculture Society, uh, Aquaculture Stewardship Council, and International Union of Conservation of Nature. They have been in the advisory board following it. We are practically at the end of the project, which is five years now. Right now, we have achieved a number of things. Next week, I'm going to talk with the FEAP on this again. Having done a number of five species in different regions, the objective is to validate the whole results across the sector. We are capable of growing fish with low levels of fish meal and fish oil. We can do this, and it's being industrially done today. And we've got to ensure that fish production is as efficient as it can be. Aquaculture is the most efficient animal production sector compared to all terrestrial animal production sectors, except maybe for milk or broilers. Our future initiatives, my thinking, is in terms of marine agronomy. That means this is where there can be potential for using discards, for instance, potential for using macro or microalgae. And one of the things that we've got to remember is the EU fish feed industry is topmost in global economy. Further, we know of species differences, how far genetic improvement of species can be affected by dietary factors, or how the interactions between feeds and breeds have to be undertaken. And we also come across one of the very interesting concepts which have been tested and validated through RINA is programming. The concept of programming involves giving a very early challenge in the early life cycle of a fish, a diet which is very low in fish meal and fish oil, and these fish are capable of remembering and capable of adjusting and being very efficient later in life, six months or one year later, when they are confronted with similar diets, they can be uh, very efficient. So this is what we call the concept of programming. So all this is useful, available today. So I'm available for your questions. I fully understand the question which were raised in the previous uh, presentation, the general presentation. We are very much concerned about the sustainability of aquaculture. We have to do, growing fish with fish is not a smart idea, so we have made much progress in reducing the reliance of aquaculture on capture fisheries. So thank you, and I remind for your any questions. Thank you very much, Sachi. Very, very good presentation. I learned a lot about uh, aquaculture, sustainability, uh, new potentials of programming fish, new potential of fish feed. And I give the floor also to Horder to have an exchange with you. Horder, please. What do you think? Yes, uh, this obviously is one of the top top trends that I had up there was, you know, how do we get new feed sources for the growing aquaculture industry? And this, so this is a very important topic. Uh, uh, Europe is, uh, when we look at Europe, European aquaculture and just European protein in general, uh, we're dependent on other countries when it comes to protein. So we also need to look at how do we generate our own protein within Europe to uh, to, to grow to, to grow the industry, and it will be absolute key to find new feed sources, whether they're from insects or, or, or lupins or from, uh, from macroalgae, uh, for both the protein but also for the, the omega-3. And of course the key is the need to be sustainable 
and they also need to be cost effective because feed happens to be the most costly ingredient um, they use in, uh, in aquaculture. And then lastly, uh, it's very important that while we, you know, have, even if we can find really good feed that, that can grow the fish and can grow healthy fish, we also need to look at the food quality uh, to make sure we, can, we, we still have a good quality end product that the consumer also needs to eat. So feed is absolutely critical. So thank you, Sasha. Okay. Sachi, do you have a response to Holder's uh, evaluation? There is no question, <laughs> is no question but uh, yeah, the thing is we can uh, uh, all the work undertaken here, we always take into account when it comes to quality, you have nutritional value, food safety in terms of contaminants of different origin, what you call undesirable compounds which can come through the food chain or from the aquatic environment itself. We are all taking into account, I mean the partners uh, working across the project have been dealing with different uh, issues. We also have very specific techniques for measuring uh, objective manner, the fresh quality. Your question was, in, uh, can we change the taste? Yes, uh, the uh, the aromatic compounds coming from fat soluble substances do have an impact. The proteins do not have much an effect, but there can be significant differences due to dietary fat uh, sources, for instance. So we do take into account all these considerations, and as you say, that uh, aquaculture is uh, developing. Feed is uh, the cost of feed is most important, but it's compared to terrestrial animal production. In poultry, feeds is 80% of the cost. Feeds is the 80%. In aquaculture, it's not yet. It's 60%, which means that we've got to make a lot of improvement in terms of husbandry and other things. Uh, where, uh, whereas in poultry, the feed cost is about 80%. So uh, it's not a big issue. Uh, there are a number of sources which are available in Europe or abroad. Uh, in outside of Europe, and these are being very well exploited right now. For instance, we mentioned about insects. There are projects which are going on right now, whether they are acceptable from the food safety part from the Commission or how much of uh, this course can be used in fish feeds. Is, these are questions which come up which we are beyond the scope of our uh, RINA project right now. Okay. Thank you, Sachi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sachi. Are there questions from the audience? If this is the case, please write a question, and uh, we also have a, a chance to to answer later. So, if there is no actual question to the Orina project, I would suggest to go on to our next project, please, which is Ecoduna, and I have a question to our presenters. Do we have Sylvia Fluch on board? Yes, I should be. Oh, I mean, very good. Here. Sylvia, very good that you are here. So can we see the next slide, please? Good morning, Sylvia. Um, you, I heard you. Maybe you could, uh, you are a bit quiet. You could speak up while uh, I first uh, will present you and the Ecoduna startup. Ecoduna is a company in Austria. It's a biotechnology research and development company, which was in many EU projects before and also had Marie Curie fellowships. So this is very welcome also in the Combibis community. Um, Ecoduna Productions GmbH is specialized on algae biomass and you have in your plant a photobioreactor technology which produces um, algal biomass in glass tubes. You see uh, in the background uh, on the photo of Sylvia, you see some glass tubes where this biomass with photosynthetic methods is produced and you are heading, you told me you are heading to produce 100 tons of this algal biomass per year and it is the first step towards attaining the market leadership as a producer of high quality algae products with a focus on omega-3 fatty acids. You will 
tell us more right now, Sylvia. You have a background, uh, you are the chief scientist of ECODUNA with a long-lasting expertise as researcher. You are also a team leader at the Austrian Institute of Technology with a focus on molecular uh, biology, population genetics, database integration, and bioinformatics. So very interesting portfolio, Sylvia, and I hand over the floor to you. We are keen to learn something from ECODUNA. Please, you have the word. Well, thank you for the introduction. I hope now you can hear me better. Can I get the first slide, please? So, yes, ECODUNA, we are existing since 2010 and we started all off as a technology company uh, with the founder saying, yes, they are not happy with the photobioreactors which are available on the market. This is why they started to develop their own ones. As was already uh, announced in the introduction, currently we are having an R&D facility with glass tubes which are a horizontal, uh, a vertical, not horizontal which means that the, the water is flowing uh, uh, um, uh, vertically up and down. So it's a meander type of flow and we don't use pumps to do this. So we try to be as close to nature as possible. Um, this photobioreactor technology is propri proprietary, so we have uh, several patents on, the, on, this, uh, on this way of producing algae. And we think this way of doing it is kind of um, improving a bit uh, the problems algae production so far had. By this, by having this photoreactor biotechnology uh, ready, we want to tap the enormous potential of microalgae as we heard already, of course, in, in for food, for feed, for aquaculture, it's really important to have these. Now also we've heard that the uh, algae um, are producing the omega-3 fatty acids which are then accumulated in fish and then are being used by humans as well. So what we will do, because we are a small startup, we will uh, have um, in 2019, we will try to have a production of about 8 tons of omega-3 fatty acids and this will be vegan, so it will be a vegan source and we decided to go for vegan oil because uh, in, to compete with uh, fish oil on the market is not that easy, so the first step will be vegan omega-3 fatty acids, which will be uh, produced by next year onwards. Um, so the next slide, just to show you a bit um, how it is looking. So we have these six meter high glass tubes which usually are used in, in, in horizontal photobioreactors and we put them column by column and in the end we will have like 150 meters long reactors to produce microalgae. This all the technology is more or less taken from the inspiration of nature and we want to bring it and we are bringing it to an industrial scale. In order to produce defined quantity and quality and yield so what we've heard already that also in aquaculture it would be important to have uh, big volumes of, of microalgae available for, for feeding. And what I've heard so far at different fairs, people were asking, can you produce 2,000 tons of microalgae? Well, we cannot. What we intend to do, we will be able to produce about 100 tons of dry mass by the end of next year on a, an, on a one hectare plant. So, and this is also why we need to go first for vegan oil, which we will extract for human consumption, and we will extract it using uh, supercritical CO2. This omega-3 fatty acids is important for human health and well-being, and especially in the vegan market, the point is that hardly any essential omega-3 fatty acids are available in vegan food, so it needs to be supplemented. This is why we will concentrate in, on producing autotrophically EPA from different microalgae which we have in our collection. So we have strain collections here in our company which we are producing in the photobioreactors then. On the next slide. You can see where the fatty acid currently is coming from. Mostly as we've heard it's coming from um, fish and marine oils. There is a little bit of algae oils and there's flaxseed oil, but there are hardly any essential oils in there. And of course, there's GMO plants like safflower, which would produce EPA. 
Um, as for the flex, uh, flex seed oil, the point is, of course, you could have uh, omega-3 fatty acids in different plants, but in order to get the essential oils and to produce them or convert them in your body, you need to be young and you need to be healthy and have enough micronutrients for the conversion. So in the aging society, which we are facing in the next centuries, we will need for sure to supplement with uh, omega-3 fatty acids and now fish and krill, which are the prime sources currently, is not the best way to go because of all the environmental problems, overfishing, environmental pollution. And also catch of krill is an ecological disaster because krill is at the bottom of the food chain. It's cheap, all the marine-based omega-3 fatty acid sources is cheap, but it is limited. So now as we go for the omega-3 fatty producing algae. We need to have specific strains and specific growth technology. In Austria we are growing them at moderate temperatures because we have some strains which are very nicely growing also in winter times at moderate temperature and not so much light. And these algae so far cannot be fermented because currently in the microalgae business also there is a, a possibility or the, the idea of, of uh, growing uh, algae heterotrophically. So some of them can grow without light, just on a carbon source, but some of those omega-3 fatty acid algae, which we are using, cannot be fermented. So still, it is like the sun-powered CO2 consumption way of production we are following up. By doing this, we will be, or we are sustainable and environmentally friendly, and we have a lot of, we use up a lot of CO2 from the, from from the, from the air, so we do CO2 sequestration by producing microalgae. Thus, it's an unlimited supply and it's a continuous supp supply of microalgae and it is vegan. So currently in Europe, if we have a look what are the competitors in Europe, there are several companies now starting up like we do, but Ecoduna has like the, long, the longest history because we do this research sin since 2010. And now by beginning of next year, we will start our big uh, production facility. The next slide, please. Yes. So you see that we are prepared to start producing microalgae, but as we are in a, in a very young research area and in a very young field of production, there are still some obstacles to come and this is why we first have to start with small amounts but I'm sure that within a few years, like five to ten years from now, we will be able to produce large quantities also to kind of go into aquaculture, fish feed, animal feed and also maybe even back to energy where all the, the ideas started from. So I'm prepared to take questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sylvia, for this very nice and inspiring presentation. So Austria, we learned, is also busy in the marine sector. And I'm uh, keen to hear the feedback from Hordo, our evaluator. Hordo, what do you think? Yeah, this is, this is excellent. Obviously, this is the future, how we're going to get our uh, omegas in a sustainable, just a sustainable way by being able to uh, grow microalgae and produce, uh, produce omegas on demand. And also what I think is important when we, when we have the omega-3 production in a controlled facility like this, you're also going to be able to control the quality of the omega-3s. So you're going to have a much higher quality and not, uh, not having, for example, oxidation issues, rancidity issues that, that you might, might face with, uh, with, with some of the marine, uh, marine omegas. But marine omegas are always going to be still a big, big part of the market, but this is just an addition, addition to, the, uh, to the omegas. And it's, it's a booming market because we know of all the positive health effects of EPA and, and, and DHA. And uh, I, was ha I was glad to hear also that you guys are going for the aquaculture. So if you can get the costs down to supply the aquaculture industry, uh, this can be, uh, can be very important. It can also differentiate some of the aquaculture products now using a ve vegan uh, uh, omega-3. Uh, the I know a lot of the uh, omega uh, uh, microalgae work in the past was centered on on the energy approach. So I'm I'm happy to hear now that that it's more of a food approach because if we if we look at the bioeconomy, the way we're developing our future bioeconomy, it's it's really food first and then energy 
last. So we're looking more at a cascading approach. So I think the, your company, Ecoduna, is following that approach. If I'm correct. So so this is this is an inspiring uh, presentation. Thank you. Okay, very good to hear. Sylvia, do you have a comment on uh, Horder's remarks? Um, well, not really comments, but I think what he very nicely mentioned is that the initial, the initial ideas of many companies and research projects to go after energy is like the back end of the, of the value chain we should have started with. Because first of all, of course, we need to go for high value products. And I think the overall, the microalgae community is now changing into this direction. And as for the problems, as I've said, yes, um, of course, we are aware that uh, the omega-3 from microalgae will just be an add-on to the fish oil, no, of course. But as we, you have to be aware that all the omega-3 fatty acids, which are gotten out from fish, are coming from algae in the beginning on the food chain. So it's like a, a ratio of, of one to three. So for one kilogram of fish, you need like three to four times the amount of algae biomass. So if we start kind of scaling up and getting the, the omega-3 from the algae, of course, this is uh, also very beneficial for the ecosystem of the marine ecosystem. Okay, very okay, much. Thank you, Sylvia. So. So, are there any questions from the audience? If this is not the case, I have a question to yeah. Sylvia. Mm -hmm. um, are, is the algae community linked to the spiruline community? Or is there um, a big difference? Well, there is, I think, algae and spirulina, which is a, a bacterium, uh, yes, they are always, when people say microalgae, they also talk about spirulina, but spirulina is not having any omega-3 fatty acids or very, very little because it is a bacterium. So it's a, this is a very different um, um, biochemical uh, connections here. But yes, the community is more or less the same, except the fact that, the, for example, in France, in the spiruline, this is kind of more an agricultural approach. But whenever it's about industrialization of microalgae production, also spirulina is covered. Okay, so the the key will be the scaling up. Uh, you also said you had some goals for reaching 2020. Are you optimistic that you sh um, uh, will be uh, achieving the 100 tons you uh, mentioned in your presentation? Yes, well, we are quite sure about this 100 tons per hectare because what we did in the last 15 months, we were kind of challenging our systems. We had documentation, we did daily measurements, so we are sure that we can do this 100 tons because what we did in a small reactors we have so far, currently we have 20 cubic meters and we were producing about 600 to 700 kilograms until now this year. So we are quite confident that this 100 tons will be okay. Mm -hmm. And there will be a market. Uh, where is the main market for you? Where do you see the uh, biggest opportunities? Well, currently uh, we've been producing different algae strains, like as you said, spirulina, also chlorella, nanochloropsis. So there are different markets. But what we have seen, um, because though very often um, what is on the market is coming from Southeast Asia or China, so quality is not very high because of environmental problems. Our quality would be a lot higher, but still markets are not really willing to pay a lot more for the biomass. And this is why we say in order to kind of justify also the high production price we currently still have, because we had to develop everything on our own, we need to go to a high value market, which then is the omega-3 vegan market. So we have, con have contacts to people who are in the fish oil market already, and they also say they can feel the pressure for vegan omega-3 fatty acid products, and this is the, the path we will go. Mm -hmm. Okay, very interesting. Are there any questions, also maybe from Horder, or uh, you leave it with that? Horder, do you have uh, another comment? Uh, just wondering how, uh, in terms of getting this to the level of using it in aquaculture, how many years you foresee you need in development to get the costs to, the, to that level? Well, I think 
there are several things which need to happen. First of all, we need to get the cost down, but also productivity up. If you compare productivity from penicillium, for example, 50 years ago and now, productivity increased 5,000 times. And now we are still working, like the microalgae community is still working with wild varieties. So whatever you find out in a lake, this is the variety we are working with. So I think there is still quite some work to be done on productivity as well, but I'm quite confident with the learnings from agriculture and also from pharmaceutical industry, we will within five to ten years be, be in the position to produce enough. Mm -hmm. May I ask Sachi here? Yes, please, Sachi. Yeah, may I ask him? Yeah, there are a number of initiatives uh, ongoing on our gay uh, uh, your choice of using it for direct human food is uh, very good. That is a way to go ahead because instead of converting through fish, you can go directly to the human food market. Uh, now, uh, I have two or three questions about there is a project, a European project called Miracles. Are you part of it? Uh, it's working on uh, no. microalgae? No, we are not. No. And there's, so why is this your choice of EPA and not both EPA and DHA? Because uh, ultimately, yeah. It yeah, depends on the strain. Like the, the EPA is done photoautotrophically by some uh, algae from the Eustigmatopsiae family. So we have one local strain isolated which is producing of the fatty acids 40% this EPA. So this is a very interesting strain. If you go to DHA, there is a Schizohydrium, for example, available, which is a heterotrophic fungus, more or less, which of course then could be grown as well, but there are companies out there who are already doing it. So we focus primarily on the photoautotrophic growth of microalgae producing compounds which are of interest. And EPA was the first one we kind of picked, but of course microalgae have like a high, huge potential and with the, with the technology we develop, we can grow virtually any. So in the last uh, year, 12 months, we were um, having algae from different families or uh, um, from different um, origin, also different pH, from, for example, from pH 2 to pH 10. We can grow mm -hmm. all of these. It's just that we yeah. had to pick one, and this one was uh, strains producing omega-3 EPA. Uh, just another point I would like to uh, add for you is that you probably have heard of uh, camelina oil. Camelina is a Brassica farm family and the UK we have now uh, there are a number of uh, uh, progress made in terms of developing extremely rich in EPA and DHA the camelina uh, and now it has been tested even with salmon. So mm -hmm. it, Again, when you come talk about uh, vegan, or mm -hmm. what you call it, whatever it is, uh, this, uh, this camelina oil has a lot of uh, potential and it probably should be included in your uh, okay. uh, thinking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Hello? Yeah, that's okay. Hi, Sylvia. Sylvia Schreiber. So, I think Sylvia's well, she's still on the. I was unmuted. I thank you. I'm sorry. Um, Sachi, thank you very much. And Sylvia, thank you very much for the Ecoduna presentation. Uh, if wished, I can join you bilaterally later and we will also publish your details so you can exchange mails and uh, Skype. We will go on now to the Prime Fish project. Um, Horodo has told us uh, before that the marine seafood might be the next superfood and Prime Fish is dealing with marine seafood on global but on local level and our presenter will be Rosa Chapela from the Spanish Setmar Foundation. Rosa is uh, in Setmar head of fisheries social economic department. She deals with fisheries and aquaculture but also the local development in coastal zones and she has already worked in Vietnam and Senegal on aquaculture 
uh, questions and she is one of the coordinators uh, who will present now what's about prime fish. Rosa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for, uh, to the Comibus uh, community for inviting us to present this, uh, this project. This project is funded by the European Union's uh, Horizon 2020 program and is coordinated by uh, Matis, by the Professor Wilmundo Stefansson. And uh, from SEDMAR, we are, feeling, we are uh, leading uh, one uh, the World Package on Shared Value and, and Dissemination and Communication. So this uh, project is focused, as uh, or, uh, uh, Professor Howard uh, has mentioned, is, is focused on the blue bioeconomy. So um, we focus on, on, this, on the side on the, the economy, and the markets of the fisheries and aquaculture products, because we uh, believe, and the European Commission also believe, that uh, uh, we have a, a great potential and we need to develop uh, innovative resources for uh, the competitiveness of the companies in, in, in fisheries and aquaculture sector from the side of the economy and the market, which uh, at this moment were um, uh, not uh, well uh, developed. So the Brankis project aims to develop an innovative market oriented prediction toolbox in order to strengthen this, the economic sustainability. And why we decide to, 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 to focus to, to in, in this kind of uh, issues related to the uh, seafood sector because uh, the European Union seafood is uh, uh, high dependent on the imported uh, uh, more or less 70, 74 percent of EU, uh, European Union seafood is imported, is imported so we need to uh, make the most of our production in terms of quality and better uh, marketing in, 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 the, in the nationals and international uh, markets. So the challenges that uh, the European seafood uh, producers are facing are uh, we need to increase the competition from the overseas. Uh, one of the most important is the variable variability of, of, the, of the prices uh, from the harvesters in capture fisheries and also the aquaculture. They are uh, submit um, a lot of boon and bust uh, and variable prices, and uh, many of the new fish products uh, that they want to introduce in the market fails because uh, they don't know how to how to better introduce into market these new uh, fisheries uh, fisheries of, or aquaculture products. Uh, there are lots of lack of information in terms of markets and in terms of value chain, uh, etc. And the producers, aquaculture and fisheries producers are also unable to meet the demands and expectations of consumers. Um, each uh, each uh, industry and fisheries and aquaculture used to, to make their, their own um, questionnaires or uh, surveys and the, uh, um, to the to the consumers, but it's it's better. We we, we believe that it's better to prepare or to organize a common um, uh, questionnaires or surveys about uh, to know the expectation of consumers, and we try to do that uh, from Prime Fish Project. And also, uh, we believe that there are inappropriate regulations, a lot of regulations, rules and regulations that influence in the competitiveness of seafood producers. We need to try, we need to address all of these uh, challenges, and we uh, believe that Prime Peace is dealing with all of these uh, um, uh, challenges in order to to, uh, to 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 try to offer solutions that. Uh, meet the needs of the different uh, industries and stakeholders dealing with the fisheries and aquaculture products. Next, please. Uh, in order to organize uh, and to deal with this, um, these challenges, we create a consortium uh, integrated by um, uh, 16, 16 uh, companies from different, um, from different countries. Uh, European countries and also from Canada and Vietnam um, and we have also two SMEs and the, uh, we collaborate with a very strong uh, industrial reference group from 
uh, also from the European Union, Canada and Vietnam. Next please, next slide. And the prime fees outcomes, the first one, the, the main uh, durable output of prime fees is the um, prime fees DSF, the Decision Support Tool. It's a software tool that um, will contain our collected and digested uh, knowledge of all the things related for uh, decision making. Uh, we will collect information, we are collecting actually information from the different uh, companies, industry and also uh, administrations uh, dealing with the markets of uh, the seafood uh, industry, trying to improve the competitiveness. So we will have in this software tool, we will have information about success and failure stories in, in, the, in the process of aquaculture and and fishery sector and also the processor the processor sector we will have information on competitive position analyzer we have we will have an, an, an a system analysis on how to better uh, into how to improve our position in, in the in the market we will have also an analyzer in uh, the value chain of the different products uh, and we will uh, have a, a demand predictor and also a growth risk analyzer and a price development predictor and the product success uh, check. So uh, these software tools is, uh, will, 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 will be an easy to use web based software with uh, uh, what if uh, tools uh, that the industry and the processors and also the, the, the policy makers can use in order to, for example, to, uh, to avoid a situation of boom and bust uh, in, in, in the prices of the, in the, in the industry uh, markets. So um, this is uh, an understanding and predicting seafood market behavior. Uh, we will have uh, all the information of the market behavior in terms in, in the seafood uh, sector. Next please. Um, now we, have, we know that uh, many information, many data, uh, economic data is not available for, uh, for the companies and also for the policy makers, which is important. So we will try to, uh, to get this information from the catching sector, from aquaculture producers, from processing companies and uh, also for market, from market anal analysts and the public authorities and we will put put uh, together this information in this uh, decision support tool as a, uh, a, an alive tool and uh, of course is meant to be public, a public tool. Uh, next slide please. So uh, we will have uh, cons the, we'll, we will have the opportunity to know the consumer preferences and price development in, in the seafood industry and the innovation and successes and failures of markets. A company, a, a, an aquaculture a company or a fisheries a company can use uh, this tool in order to, to, to predict if the new, the new innovative uh, idea uh, can be success or can be, or, or maybe failure. So uh, we can use this, uh, this tool to, to, to test our new innovative ideas. And also we will uh, enhance insights into the global value chain and the market dynamics. And it will also uh, be a prediction, use, can be used as a prediction of prices uh, and behavior and as early warnings on uh, boom and bust cycles as we mentioned before. And also, uh, we will develop a, ben a benchmark and evaluation of world-class uh, performance, as we say. Uh, so uh, we will uh, allow, we will offer the opportunity to the companies to improve uh, the st their strategic plans for the for future production and innovation, and also a better understanding of the functioning of seafood market and consumer preferences. So the, the, the overall objective is to improve the economic sustainability and competitiveness of the seafood sector. Next slide, please. And uh, at, the, at the end, uh, at the end of the day, what is, uh, what is um, behind the scene of, uh, in Brian is, is people. 
So we need uh, to, uh, it's uh, very important for us to uh, take into account this large industry reference group, that's, as we call today, uh, the group of stakeholders that are part, are uh, on board in this project and from the different uh, countries that are uh, involved in prime fish, from Norway to uh, Canada, from Vietnam, Spain, France, uh, United Kingdom, uh, Iceland, etc., and, and Italy. We we have different, uh, some different as you can see the logos, different industries, aquaculture and fish and fisheries industry, that uh, are interested in improving their processes for in the market and in uh, in in the in their industries. So um, we try to. Um, to have all these companies that, that they want to become more efficient, more competitiveness and um, profitable. So, uh, and the other idea is that uh, in, involve the policymakers uh, in order to reduce uh, the risk of boom and bust uh, from their side of uh, when they design the, the policies in the seafood market. Uh, so, uh, next, next please. And the project, uh, as we mentioned, uh, is funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 and uh, the Canadian uh, and the Vietnam uh, uh, centers are, are funded by their own uh, resources. And uh, next, and we can follow uh, us in different, uh, next please, in different um, media, social media as uh, Twitter, uh, and Facebook and, and, and different uh, social media res uh, resources uh, because we are, I think that we are uh, doing a very good uh, job in terms of dissemination and communication which is very, very important in, if, we not, if we want to, to in incorporate, to, to, to join the different uh, industries because it's a, an, open, um, an open process. We start with uh, a few companies, and now uh, more and more and more, the the industry is is uh, interested in prime fish project, and is uh, uh, and we are inviting them to participate in our industrial reference group because we need to to have more accurate data to reflect the current realm and uh, to enhance a tailor-made tool for the European industry. So it is important to to have more industry in on board. And next and final, I think it's the final one. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Rosa, for this uh, very refreshing um, uh, presentation. And I give, uh, I open the floor for the discussion with our evaluator, Horder. Horder, what do you think? Yes, this is an excellent project, and, and it's it really touching on something that's very, very important for the industry. I mean, to make it more. Uh, sustainable, economically sustainable, basically making European fisheries and aquaculture more economically sustainable, and it's absolutely key that the that they really understand the market that's out there and also understand the consumer. Which I think it was mentioned before, a lot of products actually fail on the market because there's not the dialogue is not hasn't been going on with the with the consumer. So that's one of the biggest um, trends these days, not just in seafood but in food. Uh, production, food, uh, research in general, that's getting the consumer at the table and really have consumer driven product development and also opening up the information so so it's a transparent uh, value chain so people people get to know the food and get to know where it comes from and then you know uh, get, get more information about the actual actual food and one thing uh, 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 Rosa that I wanted to maybe ask you and something I think is, is is very important for the seafood industry is really they really need to adapt more in, innovative marketing and they also need to uh, when I say innovative marketing they also need to go into e-commerce e and, and more into social media so do you have any comments on that? Uh, yes, uh, yes we are, uh, we are as, as we mentioned before we are uh, working directly with the industry, with companies, and we are asking them about uh, their preferences in, in terms of uh, com uh, com commercialization and about innovative uh, resources. And uh, at the moment, we 
we don't uh, we didn't find any new innovation in e-commerce and social media and using the social media but we are uh, we are dealing uh, we are offering these new potentials for this uh, for their uh, industry and many of the companies are also uh, are using the social media and they are following follow us uh, even and uh, th th this this um, these aspects are uh, are considered by by Primefish as uh, as a new potential for developing in the in the industries. That's the reason why we consider very very important to have uh, very close to us to the scientists uh, the different uh, industries and different uh, companies that want to to improve. Uh, and in this area of the blue bioeconomy in terms of uh, commercialization. Okay, thank you Rosa. Are there questions from the audience? If not so, I also have a final question. How is the competition from Asian markets? Uh, well, the competition is, is, is high, it's very high. Um, we are, as we mentioned, we are depending on the uh, the, import, the, the importers because um, we are not able to produce all of the food that we we are uh, we consume in in Europe, and uh, the competition from the from Asia is, is high, especially in in terms of aquaculture, is very high because of the the pangasius. And uh, we are um, also, that's the reason why we consider this uh, species as a, as a case study in prime fish, in order to know, to, to find out how it affects to the, to the competitiveness of the, uh, of the, um, the, the markets in, in Europe. And also we have a very high competition from Turkey in terms of also aquaculture, the sea bass and sea bream, they are, uh, and truth even, they are big producers in in this uh, in this uh, species. So uh, we are also now uh, analyzing how this competition will affect the uh, European market, and we will uh, we will expect to have uh, uh, results on this research for the next year. Be in mind that we are in the middle, more or less in the middle of the project, and for the next year we will uh, start with the main and the more important uh, results. Not only in terms of uh, competitiveness research, but also, which is important, also uh, with the consumer part, as Hordor have mentioned, it's very, it's very important to know the uh, preferences from the consumers in order to, or to, to better orient our uh, interest in the, in the companies. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much, Rosa, for your presentation and your contributions. Um, Horder, I think it's time for the last slide and for your wrap-up. So we will see you in the camera, I think. If you switch off the camera, sw switch on the camera, please. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so what is your conclusion? Well, we've had... Uh Excellent, inspirational, and informative uh, presentations here today by by three different different people, different groups, different projects, and I think they covered very very well some of the key trends that I, I touched upon. Uh, for example, how do we develop our aquaculture industry? And the key there is uh, is the feed. How do we get alternative feeds uh, into into the aquaculture industry? Lots of research that we need to do there. Very important. And then um, we had a talk about omega three fatty acids from microalgae, which are in fact superfoods because we know other health benefits and, and, and microalgae will be the future, how we, how we can get, how we can get uh, tailor-made omega-3s uh, into, uh, into the food chain and also into the, uh, into the, in the future in the aquaculture uh, value chain. And consumers are really demanding these days safe, natural products and also effective products with proven uh, proven bioactivities and the story around the microalgae, the sustainability is, is, is something that the consumers really, really value. And then at the end, a uh, great presentation on uh, how do we make uh, the European fishing industry more economically sustainable and also the aquaculture industry. And really the key there, I think, is information technology. You know, there's a, we need a dialogue between the companies, the researchers, and also the, the consumers so we can uh, have more successes in the uh, uh, in the industry and really drag the consumer to the to the table when we're developing uh, our product. So 
there are very exciting times ahead when it comes to the blue bioeconomy, and, and these were some examples of things that are going on, but there's lots, lots more going on, and I, uh, I hope all the audience will uh, just, just follow the developments in the, in the near future. So thank you for me. Yes. Thank you very much, Roder, for this uh, good wrap-up. I think uh, we can leave it from our side. There are no questions on the dashboard anymore. I have some technical indi indications you see here on the last slide, all the contact details um, which you can use. Uh, this uh, uh, webinar, testinar, uh, was recorded. It will be uploaded on YouTube soon, and you will also find it, the recording and the slides, on the Combibis website. We have another webinar to announce. It's next week on 6 December. IPR, intellectual property rights in the bioeconomy, might be also interesting for the algae and for the aquaculture and fishery sectors and everybody who is in the bioeconomy. So thank you very much and stay tuned. See us next week. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you.